Good afternoon. Welcome to the REAGSG webinar. My name is Abdul Aziz. I'm a technology analyst at REAGHG. We are meeting this afternoon to discuss the findings, primarily the techno economics and life cycle assessment of lower carbon hydrogen from natural gas global roadmap study. This study was conducted by Element Energy and we have the principal investigators to present and discuss the findings of this study. Firstly, a disclaimer, the technology collaboration program on greenhouse gas research and development, internationally known as REAGHG, constitutes an autonomous and independent framework within the International Energy Agency Network. Views, findings, and publications of the REAGHG do not necessarily represent the views or policies of the REA Secretariat or its individual member countries. What do we do? The mandate of REAGHG include assessment of the role that technologies can play in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. REAGHG also funds research into the development and deployment of CCS technologies, monitor and model geological storage performances, provide members, policy audience, and the public with independent technical reports. This slide presents some of the flagship activities conducted by REAGHG, but because of time constraint, I will run through just a few activities. Firstly, REAGHG has published over 350 studies covering a broad spectrum of the CCUS value chain. We do this by employing the best academic institutions and technical consultancies from around the world to undertake detailed techno-economic assessments of the different technology options and how these cost effectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The two flagship conferences organized by REAGHG are the Greenhouse Gas Technology Conference Series, which will be coming up later this year in Lyon, France, and the Post-Combustion Carbon Capture Conference Series. The International CCS Summer School, which runs over a five-day schedule, covers every aspect of CCUS. The target group for the summer school include young scientists and researchers, like PhD students and early career researchers. I was privileged to be a part of the summer school just before the COVID pandemic in 2019 in Canada, and it was an absolutely fantastic experience. I will encourage research students and those in early career research to keep a watching eye on REAGHG social handles and website to apply for the summer school against 2023. The next summer school will hold later this year in Indonesia. This slide, as mentioned earlier, indicates that the GHGT would be taking place in Lyon, France from the 23rd to the 27th of October, 2022. Over 500 presentations are expected during the conference across 13 teams that include advances in capture technologies and negative emission technologies, demonstration projects, energy and climate change policies, and transport and infrastructure development. For more information, visit the REAGHG and the GHGT website. This slide presents the REAGHG membership. Our members have been pivotal and crucial in the successes of projects undertaken by REAGHG and I would like to seize this moment to extend our utmost appreciation to all our members. 
we have from element energy connor or sullivan matt wilson and sylvian baltak who are on board to present and discuss the findings of the low carbon hydrogen from natural gas study i will be moderating this session i would like to urge you all to keep the questions coming through there is a toolbox on this webinar platform that will enable you to post your questions. This webinar is going to be recorded and will be hosted on the RIEHGHG website and RIEHGHG YouTube channel. Without further ado, sit back and enjoy the findings of the low carbon hydrogen from natural gas global roadmap study. I would like to call upon Matt and Connor to present the findings of these studies to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdulaziz. Oh, we're just getting, there we are, right on cue. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction and welcome everyone to the webinar. It's great to see you all here today. Uh, I'm gonna kick things off. My name's Matt Wilson. I'm a principal consultant at Element. I'll give a very short overview of just who we are so you know uh, what to expect. And then I'll pass over to my colleague, Connor O'Sullivan, who will talk through the presentation with you. So if we just go to the slide, first slide, Connor, there we go. So very quickly, uh, we are a, uh, a zero carbon energy consultancy. We work across uh, basically the energy space uh, from all the way from industrial decarbonization through networks, energy systems, hydrogen, transport, and built environment. Obviously today we care much more about the hydrogen and industrial aspects. Uh, and so amongst many of our clients, we often do work for IEA GHG. So this is uh, one of several studies uh, we've done and are doing, and we're very happy to present this to you today. Um, the first thing I'll say is that hopefully today is quite an interactive, interactive uh, presentation. So uh, whilst I pass over to Connor, I would encourage you to go on another screen or maybe your phone to menti.com, uh, I believe, uh, someone from IAGHD can put that in the in the chat and Connor will also flag it up on the screen and, and hopefully that just means we can get you a bit more engaged with today's discussion uh, thinking about some of the challenges and opportunities we, we've identified but without further ado I'll pass on to Connor who will flag up those uh, the introductory sessions and uh, thank you very much yes thank you Matt um, and uh, thank you for everyone for attending today um, uh, so yeah, my name's Connor and I'm a consultant who uh, 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 was heavily involved in the delivery of this project of looking at uh, CCS enabled uh, natural gas based hydrogen production. Uh, so if I just spend a moment just to set the scene a little bit um, uh, for the context of this study. Uh, so uh, at the moment, uh, uh, hydrogen has, uh, well up until this point has previously experienced uh, a number of false starts, but is currently going through uh, a significant shift in momentum um, in the UK. We're seeing uh, a significant uh, involvement with hydrogen in, as part of the uh, net zero uh, uh, plans as part of the UK. So we've seen the UK hydrogen strategy being published as well as uh, early consultations on the hydrogen business model. Um, however, um, uh, today uh, hydrogen is already um, uh, a significant industry in itself. Uh, an existing hydrogen demand uh, of approximately sort of 100 uh, megatons of hydrogen per year accounts for about a thousand megatons of uh, CO2 emissions. Um, this is primarily because uh, the vast majority of hydrogen produced today is produced from fossil fuels, as you can see from uh, the figure uh, top right, and the largest uh, feedstock in the production of uh, these of, of this hydrogen is natural gas. Uh, so at the moment, uh, this existing hydrogen production is primarily from industrial sources, uh, so the largest one uh, being refining, uh, whereas there's also significant demand um, from uh, chemical industries such as ammonia as well. Uh, so uh, in the context of this study, we're looking at taking on that largest chunk, uh, which is natural gas and some of the potential technologies for decarbonizing this part of the sector. So, far. Uh, so as I've uh, just highlighted, uh, current uh, hydrogen demand is uh, dominated at the moment by industry. However, in the future, there is potentially going to be a significant role 
uh, in a number of other sectors uh, that are growing. So uh, there's potential for hydrogen uh, to be utilized in heat. So this is primarily uh, of blending into uh, existing natural grass grids, uh, potentially a significant role in the transport industry uh, for used in fuel cell electric vehicles, uh, potentially uh, uh, more heavier forms of transport, uh, well, whether that be aviation or shipping industries as well. Uh, and also a potential role in the power sector where the uh, hydrogen turbines can be used uh, as well as stationary fuel cells as well. Um, below uh, in the bottom figure, we've uh, just given uh, an example of the scale of the demand forecast in Europe. So as you can see, it's uh, uh, by 2050, uh, the, ex the demand uh, for hydrogen could grow significantly during this time period. The uh, objectives of this study were to conduct a techno-economic analysis of some of the emerging um, uh, CCS-enabled uh, natural gas-based hydrogen production technologies. Uh, the IEA GHG had previously uh, done some detailed analysis on SMR, uh, which is uh, steam methane reforming, which is the dominant uh, form of hydrogen production today. Uh, but this study wanted to take that further and look at uh, steam methane reforming as well as uh, electrified steam methane reforming, autothermal reforming, and partial oxidation uh, configurations. Uh, this study was uh, focused in the Netherlands, as this would uh, allow comparison with uh, previously conducted studies, the IA GHG. Uh, so the report is available now, um, and there's uh, a lot more information uh, than we're able to present today. Uh, but we're hopefully going to give you a brief overview of some of our techno-economic and life cycle assessment results. Um, and as mentioned by Matt earlier, we're hoping to use the platform uh, Mentimeter uh, so you can access uh, our interactive part of the session uh, by uh, typing in the code below. I'll flag this um, up later as well. Um, and there'll also be a QR code for anyone uh, wishing to join via their smartphone. Uh, but this will hopefully give us some uh, live feedback during the presentation. So if I just uh, uh, show today um, a, a bit more of a focus on uh, the existing forms of hydrogen production today, uh, as you can see, uh, this is a figure from the IA on the uh, on the left here, that, uh, of the 90 megatons of hydrogen that are produced today, uh, about 59% of that come from natural gas-based feedstocks. Um, so there are already commercial technologies available for steam methane reforming, autothermal reforming, and partial oxidation. Um, and um, other forms uh, of uh, hydrogen production, such as gasification from coal, make up another significant portion. Uh, renewable uh, hydrogen or CCS-enabled hydrogen is currently a, a very small fraction of the production today, uh, with electrolysis uh, making up a very small portion. However, uh, in the future, this has the potential to grow rapidly um, as uh, decarbonisation plans um, come to deployment. Uh, so at the moment, uh, natural gas feedstock uh, is currently equal to about 6% of the global, global demand for natural gas. So it's a fairly significant portion uh, that needs to be decarbonized. Um, and we're looking at, in this study, applying CCS to those uh, three technologies, as well as uh, the fourth technology, which is an electrified version of the conventional steam methane reforming. So if I just uh, uh, go into a bit more detail of the configurations that we've investigated, uh, so starting off with the steam methane reforming process, uh, this is uh, an adaption of, of a uh, of the fairly conventional uh, process, but it's based on uh, the case three of uh, a, the 2017 study that the IEA GHG uh, have already done on steam methane reforming. Uh, so um, as you see, stage one where you get the uh, natural gas visa of input. Um, stage two, where you have, as it's an endothermic process, you need to supply uh, large amounts of heat to the process. So this is done by natural gas combustion. Uh, and then your methane is uh, mixed with your steam at very high temperatures to reform, uh, reform it into hydrogen, um, where you're produced at stage four. Um, and any emis emissions from the flue gas are captured uh, via uh, the capture unit at stage five. Um, the uh, electrified steam methane reforming configuration is slightly different. Uh, the primary change here 
is that um, the na natural gas uh, fuel stage where the heat is supplied to ref the reformer is electrified. Uh, so you therefore don't have any emissions coming from a flue gas. Uh, so therefore the capture plant is now um, employed uh, downstream of the water gas shift. Um, uh, and this is a configuration uh, that uh, as part of the analysis in this study that we investigated alongside uh, some enga stakeholder engagement with Hal de Topso, who are one of the stakeholders who are actively developing uh, this uh, hydrogen production technology. Uh, one thing to note is that this technology is uh, a much lower technology re readiness level than the others investigated in this study, uh, but it is included as it could potentially um, uh, lead to significant emissions reduction in the future. So if I now moving on to the other two configurations, uh, so the autothermal reformer, um, one thing to note on this is that uh, now um, the natural gas fuel demand is replaced by a supplying of oxygen into the process. Um, and in the configuration that we have selected, uh, we've also chosen to include a gas heated reformer. So this is uh, known as the ATR uh, plus the GHR, or uh, sometimes known as the low carbon hydrogen configuration. Um, as this is, uh, this was based on uh, a study done by H21 North of England, which was a, uh, de a very detailed uh, sort of pre-feed study into uh, options for hydrogen production. Um, so we use this uh, configuration as part of our techno-economic uh, analysis. Uh, the POX configuration, um, this uh, is similar to the autothermal configuration, as in it doesn't require a supply of heat. Uh, for the reforming process and, and similarly to the ATR, uh, it, is, um, it uses a, uh, a supply of pure oxygen. Um, so this, this is again uh, well, supplied by an air separation unit which primarily, primarily runs on electricity. Um, one of the advantages of this POX process is that there is no requirement for a feed gas pretreatment. So this can uh, significantly uh, reduce the complexity of plant deployment. Um, we chose uh, the configuration that is being developed by Shell and, that, and their uh, blue hydrogen production process for our analysis. So just to quickly uh, go through some of the comparisons of um, the data that we used um, in our techno-economic analysis. Uh, at the top, we've got a comparison of the energy demand, as you can see on, on the left axis. Uh, we're looking at the natural gas, so you can see that the SMR configuration uh, has the highest overall uh, nat natural gas consumption, uh, and this is primarily because you have that additional uh, natural gas requirement for the fuel input, um, whereas um, yeah, whereas the, all the other technologies are slightly lower. Uh, the lowest is for the ESMR technology. Uh, this is primarily due to the electrification uh, of the process. You can uh, get some uh, efficiency savings by making the react uh, reformer more compact um, and get some improvements uh, from uh, for, from that side of things on the right however you we've got the electricity demand so you can see for the atr and the pox they're slightly higher than the smr configuration um, and this is due to the requirement to run the air separation unit the esmr is significantly higher as um, the the energy demand to electrify um, the heating process to the reformer is very energy intensive. Uh, so that's why you can see that that red, red uh, diamond is so high in comparison to the other technologies. Uh, just moving down to the CO2 ca capture and, and emissions comparison, uh, you can see that again, SMR um, has the highest uh, overall capture, uh, but it also does have um, slightly higher emissions than the other processes. Uh, so this is due to, you can see the capture rate is shown on the right hand axis. So um, uh, the SMR has the lowest capture rate with the analyzed technologies at 90%, uh, whereas we're getting up to about 94 for ATR uh, and up to 100 for, well, 99% plus for POX and uh, high 98s uh, identified at the early stages for ESMR. So just to have a, a quick update of um, uh, the status of some of these technologies in terms of actual project deployment. 
Um, the steam methane reforming process with CCS is actually operating commercially uh, in North America currently. So um, there's the examples of the Air Products uh, Port Arthur project, um, as well as the Quest project, uh, where uh, captured CO2 is utilized for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, partial oxidation, um, there are projects uh, without CCS that have been deployed. Uh, so uh, um, examples are in Malaysia and Qatar. However, we're currently unaware of any uh, plans to deploy POX with CCS in the future at the moment. Um, autothermal reforming with the gas heated reformer. Um, this is the one that has seen the most interest. Uh, many projects announced in the, in the UK, such as uh, Hynet and H2H Salt End. Uh, which, uh, some of some of the projects um, looking to um, gain well gain funding in the next stages of the U, um, uh, the UK uh, se uh, cluster sequencing process, um, and then the uh, electrified steam methane reformer is currently being developed by Held Topso, and they're um, in the process of uh, developing and testing their pilot facility in Denmark. Uh, so, so now we were hoping uh, to go to our first uh, interactive question. Uh, so if if possible, if everyone could uh, join uh, via the Menti link, um, and hopefully if I uh, switch switch over now uh, and move to the first question, uh, we should hopefully come to our, uh, let me know if this isn't working, Tom, but, um, hopefully, if you could all input your responses about uh, which technology you're most excited by, and we should hopefully see some live updates. So yeah, we can see the results coming in, so that's a positive sign that it's working. I'll let this run for a little while longer, just as they keep coming in. Uh, see some initial excitement over POX, um, and, ooh, and it's changing again. <laughs> Uh, one one vote for the electrified steam methane reformer. Okay, it looks like uh, oh, nope, it's still going. We'll give it another another fifteen seconds or so. Okay, I might. Well, I'll let that run in the background, but I'll keep going through the slides. Uh, but yeah, if you haven't voted, keep keep them coming in. Okay, uh, so to now just quickly run through some of uh, the assumptions uh, that we used in the study. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to go through these in too much detail um, as uh, we don't have time today. But there, if you are interested, there is a lot of information in the report as well as uh, a very detailed appendix of the report. Um, so in terms of the boundary conditions that we considered, um, you can see from the figure top right that we've broken these down into separate gateways. Uh, so gateway one considered the hydrogen production facility and compression, compression stage. Uh, gateway two uh, also involved the uh, transportation of uh, CO2 and its storage. And finally, gateway three was the hydrogen uh, distribution and storage as well. Uh, we didn't consider any uh, past up to the hydrogen end use case. Um, all operational facilities were based on a 300 megawatt uh, facility with a 25 year lifetime. Uh, so this was to enable comparisons uh, with other IEA GHG projects. Um, and we've used discount factors of uh, five, eight and 10%. Um, uh, a range of technology readiness levels were uh, available. So uh, the SMR was the most developed and already operating commercially. Uh, others um, uh, have already been deployed uh, without CCS, whereas the ESMR is still very early stage development. Uh, so we've tried to take this into uh, consideration when calculating costs and uh, other factors where possible. Um, so CAPEX and fixed OPEX were based on literature reviews and uh, a fairly extensive stakeholder engagement process as part of the study. Um, and we tried to homogenize these where possible to enable like-for-like like, like like comparisons between each technology. Um, as the hydrogen production we were assuming would be based in the Netherlands uh, in the port of Rotterdam, uh, we were we were making the assumption that the Porthos uh, CCS infrastructure would be able to be utilized. 
Uh, so there's some data we uh, used on the right in terms of uh, the poor cost costs, um, as well as some of our own internal assumptions on CO2 pipeline uses um, as well. Uh, as well, in terms of the hydrogen distribution demand, um, as the port of Rotterdam industrial area is uh, heavily industrialized, we're assuming fairly short distances uh, and of, for transporting hydrogen to the end user. And this would be uh, transported via pipeline. Uh, so the assumptions of this came from the IEA's future of hydrogen. Um, in terms of uh, the variable and operational costs and the CO2 prices, we've um, provided the two uh, sets of data that we use below. Um, uh, as you can see, we've well, we've what we tried to do was uh, localize these to the Netherlands uh, up to 2030 for our forecasts using a more um, uh, broad European forecast beyond 2030 uh, and our CO2 prices were from the World Energy Council and the BP Energy Outlook. Uh, as you can see, uh, well, the study was conducted uh, around 2020, 2021, so um, unfortunately the, the recent um, uh, changes to the energy uh, price forecast haven't been incorporated in this study, uh, so the, these were accurate um, at, well, at the time of the analysis was done. In terms of reductions up to 2050, um, we applied uh, a range of learning rates, uh, so 5% and 20% sensitivities uh, with a scale increase of 5.5. And there were also cost reductions for the CO2 transport and storage um, as well, but they were also exposed to the higher variable OPEX and CO2 prices in the future. Uh, but again, uh, there is much more detail in the full report, and if anyone wants to dig into the details, I'd uh, recommend that as the best, best place to start. Uh, so if I just go back now, uh, we've got our second question on uh, the Mentimeter. Uh, so what, we're, what we've... Uh, found as part of this study is that natural gas is the largest cost driver in 2020 and 2050. Um, but what the question is, what do you think the second greatest cost driver will be in the 2020s? So we've got a, a range and you can hopefully um, add a scale. So between electricity, uh, the CO2 transport and storage costs, as well as the hydrogen distribution and storage, carbon pricing and the plant capex. Um, so I'll leave this to run for a, a few seconds and we'll hopefully be able to see um, the results come in and update live. So we can see carbon pricing is taking a slightly early lead, but uh, there's a definitely a very wide spread of results uh, appearing. Okay, I'll let this uh, keep going for another few seconds, but it all seems, it seems to, the averages seem to be leveling out a little bit. <laughs> okay, that should hopefully keep running in the background. So if you have, uh, if you're still inputting your answers, then that should hopefully keep working. Uh, so if now just to move on to some of uh, the results that we had uh, from our study. Um, so uh, initially looking at the levelized cost of hydrogen in, in the Netherlands in, in 2020. As you can see, uh, the reference case, which is the steam methane reformer without CCS, is the lowest cost option, uh, whereas all, all other CCS enabled technologies are higher costs. So uh, this is ranging from an 11% to 33% increase. Uh, as you can see, uh, the POX is the, the lowest cost CCS enabled option with the, the SMR the highest. Uh, some of the things uh, that are uh, consistent for all technologies is that the cost of natural gas feedstock is the largest cost component uh, for all technologies. The SMR um, uh, has the disadvantage of also requiring natural gas uh, as part of its fuel input, whereas the ATR and the POX uh, have uh, larger electricity requirements to run their air separation units. Uh, the ESMR has uh, 
a huge uh, electricity consumption, and that is due to the electrifying of that heating process. Uh, for all technologies, um, there's also uh, a fairly significant cost associated with uh, the CO2 transport and storage. Um, but to conclude, uh, in the 2020s, all CCS enabled hydrogen uh, would be more expensive than that uh, of the unabated alternative. The scenario in 2050 uh, changes quite significantly. Uh, so, as you can see, the reference case is now the most expensive, um, and this is primarily driven by the increasing price uh, of carbon. Uh, so, in this scenario, we've used a carbon price of 162 euros 46. Um, uh, we did analyse other sensitivities within the report. Um, but you can see now that the cost reduction for CCS enabled hydrogen reduces by 17 to 31 percent. Um, some things have stayed the same, so the cost of natural gas, uh, natural gas feedstock is still the largest cost component for all of the CCS enabled uh, hydrogen production technologies, uh, but we're now seeing a significant reduction as well in the cost of CO2 transport and storage, and this is uh, due to uh, some assumptions around um, increased availability and development of uh, CO2 uh, storage sites and uh, economies of scale developing from that. Um, even for CCS enabled technologies, we're seeing um, a, a carbon price being a relatively significant uh, cost component of, uh, of the total levelized cost of hydrogen. Uh, and this is partly due to the fact that um, the capture doesn't uh, capture 100% uh, of emissions. Uh, so you still get um, some residual emissions as part of the production process, uh, but also um, we've accounted for um, some of the emissions uh, associated uh, as part of the upstream processing of this methane. Uh, so that accounts for, and as well for the electrical uh, grid um, emissions as well. Um, but overall, um, all CCS enabled um, hydrogen production technologies will be cheaper than an unabated alternative by 2050 was the conclusion we came to. If I now um, quickly run through some of the results from the life cycle assessment. Uh, so the first thing to note was this was done by our project partners CE Delft, uh, who um, they unfortunately aren't with us on the call today, uh, but they were the ones who carried out the life cycle assessment. Um, a few things to note were that this life cycle assessment was a cradle to gate system boundary and you can see uh, the system boundaries that we used uh, in the figure bottom right so this is from the point of natural gas extraction uh, uh, through production up to compression uh, but also includes some of the auxiliary materials and co2 storage um, the the study primarily primarily focused uh, on the carbon footprint of the technologies However, other environmental impact categories were also considered. Um, these weren't investigated in as much detail, but um, further information is also available within the report. Um, so this is uh, some of the results from the life cycle assessment in the 2020s. Again, as you can see on the left, um, uh, the steam methane reforming process without CCS has the highest carbon footprint. Um, whereas uh, the CCS enabled technologies um, have significantly lower. Um, you can see the dashed part of the bars. This is uh, trying to represent the amount of CO2 that is actually captured and stored, uh, therefore not contributing to that carbon footprint. Um, whereas um, you have the dark green bits of the bars being the dark green uh, direct CO2 emissions. So you can see for the SMR and ATR, there are still um, uh, fairly large uh, quantities of direct emissions, and this is uh, due to the lower capture rates, uh, which are re represented by the red triangles at the top of the figure. Um, one of the things to note um, is the uh, carbon footprint associated with the natural gas. Uh, so this is the blue part of the chart. Um, this is partly due to the methane leakages that occur as part of the hydrogen uh, production process upstream uh, of the hydrogen production plant. Uh, this uh, fairly hard to overcome as part of uh, technology deployment. Uh, the other thing to note is the large carbon footprint associated with the electricity grid uh, and this is partly due uh, to 
uh, gr the grid in the Netherlands in the 2020s uh, not being fully decarbonized at this stage. Before we now just move to see how this changes in 2050. Uh, as you can see, there's a um, the benchmark uh, remains the same uh, as the emissions or the footprint associated with the natural gas uh, remains consistent. Uh, what you do see is a significant reduction in uh, the carbon footprint associated with the electricity from the grid. So uh, the carbon footprint of those yellow bars is significantly reduced. Uh, so this is, uh, we're expecting reduction. Uh, well, the uh, electricity intensity of the grid to reduce by about 67% uh, uh, in, in the period of 2020 to 2030. Um, and uh, one of the key recommendations for all CCS enabled hydrogen production plants would be a, to ensure that they have a sustainable supply of uh, low carbon electricity. So this could either be via direct wire or more likely via um, green PPAs, power purchase agreements. So um, now just to um, finally uh, present some of the conclusions before we'll hopefully go into our uh, final interactive se uh, session and um, more open Q&A. So in the short term, uh, this study established that um, unabated uh, hydrogen production will remain cheaper than any CCS uh, enabled alternative. However, in the future, uh, as carbon pricing increases, this will uh, make uh, grey hydrogen production or uh, significantly less attractive as an economic option and there will be at some point in the future there will be a crossover where the CCS enabled options become uh, the more economically friendly uh, investment. Uh, in the short term uh, CO2 transport and storage uh, is a, signif um, it's a significant cost component for all technologies um, and this should be a priority area to uh, reduce uh, the levelized cost of hydrogen production. Uh, this is expected as other industrials uh, look to uh, uh, develop networks as part of industrial clusters um, and uh, in the future the uh, cost will come down. Um, in terms of the life cycle assessment, um, it was clear that all investigated natural gas based uh, technologies have a significantly lower carbon footprint than uh, the base case. Um, so that was due to uh, the minimum capture rate being considered in this study being 90%. However, higher capture rates will lead to uh, lower carbon footprints. Uh, in terms of uh, further recommendations, um, we've uh, seen a number of um, early feasibility studies, but there need to uh, be uh, further support for ongoing fee studies to take these projects from the concept to actual deployment stage. Uh, and there also needs to be support uh, for some of these emerging technologies such as ESMR um, and other, other new technologies um, that could potentially uh, provide or play a significant role in a low carbon hydrogen future. Um, the de de development of policy instruments will also be uh, a key driver for um, accelerating this change to a low carbon hydrogen future. Uh, so this should uh, not only be for the low carbon hydrogen production, but also for the necessary transport and storage infrastructure uh, that is required to uh, supply it to its consumers. Uh, and finally, um, uh, is this uh, a fairly common conclusion um, across industries is that uh, the development of the shared CCS infrastructure should um, lead to uh, economies of scale being uh, leveraged as um, lower costs and greater utilization um, will uh, in ensure that um, CCS enabled hydrogen will play a greater role in the future of these uh, clusters and helping other industrial emitters decarbonize in the future. So I think now we've just got um, our final uh, section of the Menti discussion. Uh, so if I uh, just open up the first question. This will hopefully give the audience uh, an opportunity to uh, respond um, uh, with a text response. So the first question is, what are the implications of 
the rising feedstocks or utility prices uh, for the growth of blue hydrogen. Uh, so hopefully we'll we'll see some of these answers coming in. So we're seeing a couple of turn to green hydrogen, which delayed deployment and the potential that the blue hydrogen ship has already sailed. Okay. Yep, so a lot of lot of interesting responses coming through. Um, need for higher carbon price, another inter interesting point. Okay, I might uh, might move on now to the next question. So, hopefully, you should all be able to see this now. Um, so, how will blue hydrogen compete with green hydrogen? Okay, so I can see these responses coming through now. Obviously, I think we've seen a bit of a policy shift in some places, but um, and so I think there's some recognition that whilst blue hydrogen is still being supported in some places, we've seen obviously some, particularly in, in Northern Europe and, and the UK, some projects announced which are likely to be shortlisted for funding. Um, green hydrogen is perhaps accelerating, but I think as I saw someone else say on another page, uh, important to see how long this lasts. And, and, and how um, exposed blue hydrogen is to the to the, the price signals, um, and, and what also happens outside of Europe. Obviously, it's a rather European-centric study, but there are other regions which perhaps aren't exposed to the same price signals. Um, so, very interesting to see. Okay, thanks everybody for the response. We've got one more question. So. Um, this is uh, maybe slightly different, but how might blue hydrogen from oil imports compete with blue hydrogen from natural gas? Um, so in parallel to the natural gas-based study, Element also conducted a, a study on the potential for CTS-enabled uh, hydrogen production from oil-based feedstocks. Uh, so uh, we're actually having a webinar in, I think it's the 13th of September. Um, so we'll go into more detail on that, uh, on that date. For those that are saying no idea, definitely come to the webinar, You'll learn a bit more about it. <laughs>
Yeah, I think the carbon footprint po carbon footprint point is very important. We've seen some recent studies, obviously you can see in ours, the exposure to the feedstock carbon intensity. So it's very important that you uh, it's measured appropriately and that the appropriate um, carbon standards and measures are in place to, to capture that so that we know what we're getting is truly zero, is truly low carbon. Um, cool. Yeah, more of that. Okay. Should we go on to some questions? Of disease, I think we've uh, got some great um, engagement from, from the team uh, and the uh, and the attendees. So thank you, everyone. Um, I think there are questions in the chat, and I believe uh, I, we can see some of them scrolling through. But if you want to to pick for a few and uh, and ask some of those, we can we can pick them up. Otherwise, I can do that, actually, yeah. just do that. Um, so I think I can see a question from Chet uh, Biliok. So I'll ask, put this to Connor. Did you consider emissions and costs associated with oxygen supply for ATR and POX? Do pick that one up? Yes. So I think as part of um, the life cycle assessment um, uh, that C Delft, our partners, conducted, uh, the electricity intensity um, uh, and emissions associated with the production of the oxygen-based plant, so the air separation unit, were included as part of the carbon footprint in the life cycle assessment. Yeah, thanks, Connor. Um, I've got a question from a few questions actually from Neil Rimmer. Thank you, Neil. Uh, if, if we, if we, I will say in advance, if we don't get to all your questions, feel free to drop us an email. Um, what hydrogen distribution was looked at, use within the Rotterdam area or transport to a wider location? So in this study, we were uh, primarily looking at very localized transport. So uh, that's why it formed a, um, a very small component of the levelized cost of hydrogen. Um, however, um, I guess uh, in, the, in the parallel study that we conducted, um, uh, we did consider shipping from a number of different regions uh, of hydrogen to Europe and uh, other potential large-scale places of demand, such as East Asia and um, North America as well. But in, in this, uh, as part of this study, it was very much localized pipeline distribution uh, to industry. Got a question from Lee Pua. I'll pick this one up. Uh, Pox is shown to have a lower cost in carbon footprint via UK projects, for example, focusing more on ATR. Um, I suppose I, my my point to this would be that there are yet to be any sort of obviously large scale blue hydrogen projects, and so um, whilst uh, there are, you know, in in the central case we showed that POX can actually be very competitive. Um, there's there's less data out there about POX, for example, than compared with ATR, and so there still remains to be seen whether that actually bears fruit. Um, so when you consider some sensitivities, there's strong overlap actually between quite a few of the cases. I think Connor can flash that up. Um, this is in the study in the report if you want to have a look at it rather than trying to digest all that now but the main thing is that you can see there's quite a lot of overlap between the technologies um, so it's great to see that um, different technologies are being picked up in the UK there's a particular uh, 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 favor, uh, favoritism at the moment for, for ATR um, obviously not just due to cost but also due to perhaps more some of the flexible operation and, and the capacities that are being touted so um, it's important to see how that progresses and I think it's a fairly open question um, so there's a question from Tim Podesta, the 2017 SMR and CC study is a great reference. How does the 22 study base case compare to this? Have assumptions been updated? Um, do you want to take this one or do you want me to pick it up? So I would say that I think I would see the, the SMR case still as a very, as, as that, that paper, still as a very strong reference tool. Um, there are other configurations technologies that are being developed by various stakeholders. So like ATR, you've got the ATR plus GHR configuration now. 
there are some GHR configurations of SMR that are being um, touted by various project developers. And so um, I'd see it as a great reference tool for the base case. I'd say what our study's done is, is looked more at the, uh, the sort of the four technologies in tandem, how they sort of compare in the sort of the base case, recognizing that there's a lot of work to do to, to pick up individual technologies and how those might be appropriate for individual sites. Um, and certainly there's, there's work to do there. Obviously, as, as, as we recognize, we saw that parts could potentially be very low cost, but as, as shown on this slide, there's, there's quite a lot of overlap. And so it's very, gonna be very exciting to see how these different technologies are picked up uh, globally. Uh, just looking through the other questions. Um, what costs were allocated by methodology to try the CO2 prior to compression and pipeline transit? Um, I'll pick that up. I'll say that um, the, I say the way we did the CO2 costing, so it's twofold. The first is that um, there is public data for, for Porthos that we showed previously. Um, so that's a TNS fee, and that's inclusive of things like, like what you're listing and, uh, and, and I suppose other commercial factors. And so I would say that we probably didn't go down to the level of granularity that you're identifying there. Um, the work that we then did perhaps for future costs and, and compared with our own work is the stuff we've done for the UK government on CO2 um, transportation and shipping. Uh, just trying to, and that particularly is relevant for the, for the parallel study we did on oil, which looked at more um, distant storage than perhaps just the Porthos project. Uh, and so that was inclusive of CO2 compression um, and, and processing, uh, CO2 pipeline, CO2 shipping, and, and, and some degree of injection. So um, I wouldn't say, you know, we're not going down to, the, to the, the specific item of equipment, but certainly by stage, we're able to attribute a cost to that. And there's a separate paper, which is on our website, which covers um, the costs associated with uh, CO2 uh, handling, I suppose. Uh, Connor, one for you. Um, again, from Neil Rimmer, thank you. Are the capture rate percentages shown actual industrial scale or theoretical? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I think the uh, the capture percentages uh, were taken from a combination of literature review uh, as well as stakeholder engagement. Um, so what we found, uh, oh, what we defined early on in the study was that to qualify as low carbon uh, hydro or blue hydrogen uh, was that we were only going to consider capture rates of 90% and above. Um, that is, I think, now seen as maybe uh, as a minimum within the industry to be considered low carbon hydrogen. I know uh, in the UK we're, or globally, we're looking to move away from a color based approach for capture. Um, uh, but and now it's going to be uh, based on a sort of grams of CO2 per, per megawatt hour basis. So um, I think what we're seeing now is uh, an increase uh, in some of these capture rates uh, uh, being um, claimed by industry and stakeholders. Uh, but again, uh, they haven't, I guess we haven't seen in a lot of these cases, we haven't seen the, these develops in practice. Um, but we're, uh, I guess um, for the ATR, we used a capture rate of 94%, uh, but I think now we're potentially seeing claims in industry that up to sort of 97% could be deployed in the future. Yeah, I think almost the case of CCS now is actually how the, the feedstock and, and fuel are handled upstream and the emissions associated with that. We're seeing increased focus on those aspects as the capture rates improve. Um, question from Pavel Pranda, thank you. What's your opinion on the US moonshot? Essentially very low cost hydrogen. Um, I would say it's ambitious. Um, I think the, 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 the point you've got to get to when you're getting to one dollar a kilogram is essentially you're paying nothing for your capital and essentially you're almost using let's take in the case of green uh you know um basically curtailed electricity um it's a very locational specific um and at that point you need your capex to be very low so you know sub 500 pounds a kilowatt if you're talking um the more the blue side, again, you're talking about access to um, almost feedstock, which, which is losing its value, maybe due to market or, 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 or sort of very strong policy incentives. So it's, a, it's, not, it's good to have a target. I think when we think about Northern Europe, I'm, I'm very impressed when, when technologies can get sub two. And I'd say as a, as a, as a trend, um, perhaps some parts of the sector tend to underestimate the cost of things like balance of plant and the engineering works which can sometimes increase the cost a little bit from what we've seen. Um, but 
so so whether the US moonshot comes to comes to fruition, uh, yeah, fingers crossed. But um, I'll I'll be impressed if it does. Um, I think there's a question from Yerdalat Abuov. Um, how how are carbon credits shared between low carbon hydrogen and low carbon oil when blue hydrogen and CO2 ER are coupled? I'm going to be completely honest. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, it's something that we could we can consider and take away. I think this might be relating to the 45Q tax credits. And so, if you're capturing the um, the CO2 from a, for example, so the 45Q is a, is a policy in the states where injection of CO2 captured um, essentially gets you tax credits. Previously, about $45 per ton, I believe, uh, it might be doubling up soon. Um, uh, in terms of how that balances across your 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 um, your balance sheet, I suppose, or your cash flow, I'm honestly not sure. Um, I think it's one of those things where I expect we probably you, you know one might put it in in a model, and and then you'd have to do sort of a commercial discussion. Um, what I'd say is for this particular assessment is that we didn't account for sort of policy initiatives or incentives in the in the cost. So if you are expecting, for example, capital subsidy from the innovation fund or, um, uh, or or local national support, whatever it may be, that would be additional to to the, what we've what we've shown today. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, so what I would say is. Thank you very much for listening today. Um, as Connor said, the report is uh, is now available on, online on the IEA GHG website. So hopefully, uh, if you haven't yet, and you, this is the first time engaging with the study, uh, it's, it's piqued your interest and you, you, you're quite keen to go and, and read more about it. Um, uh, and, and secondly, as Connor said, there's a second webinar that we're going to be hosting on the parallel study. Um, which, checking the calendar quickly, I believe you're right, is on the 13th of September, so that's a few Tuesdays away, um, where we'll be talking about uh, the, essentially um, particularly hydrogen production from oil, which is a, a global study, so not just looking at the Netherlands, but what happens when you produce it in Africa, in Africa South America, um, etc. Um, so hopefully that sounds of interest as well, and we'll see a few of you there as well. Um, Abdulaziz, any, any final remarks? I'm very well. I'm, I would like uh, to say thank you muted. very much. Oh, very well then. Let me try to. I'm not muted. Can you hear me? Uh, I can't hear you. I don't think. Like, you can hear me, isn't it? I'm not muted. Nope. It's not working for you either, is it? I can hear you, Abdul Aziz. Oh, okay, fantastic. Very well. Um, since you can hear me, fantastic. Very well then. Um, I would like to thank Matt Wilson and Connor Sullivan um, for this very great and interesting presentation. I would like to reiterate and to remind our audience to um, keep the date for the second parallel um, study, which is low carbon hydrogen, blue hydrogen um, from oil based feedstock. Thank you very much. Um, for um, sharing the hour with us and we look forward to seeing you again on the 13th of September for the second study. Thank you very much all and see you all.